Welcome to Alienating the Audience, a show exploring the deeper meaning of science fiction. I'm Andrew Heaton, the thinking man's nerd, and today we're going to explore the mythology of Star Wars. That's right, we're going to go on the hero's journey. Find a trusty droid and a glowing forced ghost mentor, and let's go! I am joined today by Dr. Ryan Schlesinger, who is a visiting professor of English at Oklahoma State University. And apparently you and I overlapped uh, when I was uh, at the University of Oklahoma, but but I'm not reaching out to you as as a chum. I'm reaching out to you because you taught a class on the hero's journey and Star Wars. That's right. So, uh, so the, the hero's journey, we're getting into like deep mythological stuff. We're getting into Joseph Campbell. We're, we're getting into like, you know, really kind of tectonic plates and archetypes and that kind of thing. So when, when people refer to the hero's journey, what, what do they mean by that? What are, what are we referencing? Well, so the, the first thing to mention is the difference, difference between myth and mythology. Okay. So when we're talking about the hero's journey, we're talking about different mythologists who have traced patterns through the myth that they have studied. Um, so there are a number of different mythologists who have come up with different hero's journey patterns. Okay. Uh, the one that we're the one we're talking about specifically is Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. Right, and he's kind of the most famous of of this clique. Right, he's the most famous, uh, and he and he is the most famous because he directly influenced George Lucas writing Star Wars. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. So with with George Lucas, um, is is this a thing where he heard of Joseph Campbell and he was like, oh, mythology? I like that idea. Maybe I'll, you know, I might incorporate some into that. Or, or is that a thing where George Lucas was, you know, reading his book, uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and actively trying to model Star Wars off of it? Like, how instrumental is is this mythological outlook in Star Wars? It's essential. Um, it. This is the pattern that George Lucas adopts when he writes Star Wars. Um, He reads The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which Campbell published in 1949. Uh, Lucas reads that when he's in college at USC. Mm -hmm. Um, And then once he completes the book, uh, he's, he's mentioned this in several interviews. He puts the book down and he says, that was a book with a wonderful life force. Uh And then he goes on to write Star Wars about the force. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he read that book. I actually have a, a quote here from him. Um, and he says, I was trying to take certain mythological principles and apply them to a story. Ultimately, I had to abandon that and just simply write the story. I found that when I went back and read it, uh, then started applying it against the sort of principles that I was trying to work with originally, they were all there. It's just that I didn't put them in consciously. I'd sort of immersed myself in the principles that I was trying to put into the script, and these things were just indelibly infused into the script. Then I went back and honed that a little bit. I would find something where I'd sort sort of gotten slightly off the track, and I would make it more, let's say, universal in its mythological application. So he had read The Hero with a Thousand Faces, and he sat down and tried to use it as a template to create a story, uh, but found that to be too difficult. And whenever he started writing the story, what he realized was that he had internalized this hero's journey pattern Mm. and the story he was writing was coming out in that form. Yeah. So it was happening like, well, like, like uh, immediately what I'm struck by in just your description of this is um, I've read a book. I think a lot of people that are involved in entertainment have read a book called Save the Cat and Save the Cat is a script writing uh, premise or a script writing how to. Um, where it goes through beat for beat and says, like, if you're writing an hour and you know 45 minute long film, you need to establish the character at this time. It, and it sounds like there's some of that going on here, but it sounds like the mythological element is is putting in uh, sort of deeper emotional touchstones. It's not just a sense of plot right. uh, plot of of plot works well when these things happen, but these things are 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 emblematic of deeper forces, and that's what makes it so resonant. Yes, exactly. And that these these symbols that he's using come from this deep wellspring of the imagination uh, that Carl Jung calls the collective unconscious, mm-hmm. uh, which is a, a click further down than Freud's unconscious, which is the repository of repressed desires, is very personal. Uh, Jung calls Freud's unconscious, the personal unconscious, and then hypothesizes 
the collective unconscious, which Campbell totally follows him on. And so uh, the difference between myth and plot here is that, well, it, in literature, plot is just the events that are happening. Right. And the way that I think about this um, and convey it to my students is if you were to read The Sound and the Fury um, by William Faulkner, which is a, a very disorienting book. If you were to read the cliff notes of it, it would be much easier to see, oh, event A happens, then event B happens, then event C happens. But it's the way that the story is being told that brings a lot of the magic to that telling of the story. Right. And so he, he's pulling these symbols from um, the archetypes, which are patterns of existence that are imprinted on our collective unconscious uh, by millennia of human experience. And so then those kind of crystallize and they arise out of the collective unconscious, according to Campbell, and find their way into our dreams and our myths. I buy that. That makes a lot of sense to me because I feel like obviously plot is a good part of or an extremely important part of literature. It's an extremely important part of uh, of, of script writing, but it is about events. It's a, it's in, in, you know, plot is the, the story itself. Mythology is the, the, the underlying, um, the, the underlying angst or emotion or, uh, or meaning, I guess yeah. would be a good way of putting it. Like the, the meaning that, that takes place, uh, is there. So like, like when we get into Darth Vader, like it's like the plot point right. is that, you know, Luke, spoiler alert, Luke discovers that Darth Vader yeah. is his father. <laughs> Uh, but that's that's the plot point. The deeper thing is that we all have a much uh, more resonant idea of what a father figure is or the relationship we have with our fathers or, or the role of the hero and the father. And that's what we're getting into, I think, with Joseph Campbell and with the hero's journey. Absolutely. And so what, uh, Campbell was fond of uh, defining myth as metaphor. And he fielded this question in numerous interviews Um because our cultural understanding of myth is as a falsity. And if you, if you look, if you were just to uh, Google search myth, we would find um, the myth of nationalism or the myth right. of, of whatever it is. We use it as, we use it as a pejorative uh, to, to imply that it's fictitious. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and Campbell is saying, well, it, it's neither fact nor fiction. Um, myth is a metaphor. And mm -hmm. so what we're looking at with plot, the actual events, the actual characters, Darth Vader uh, or Luke Skywalker, these are the denotation. These are the things that we actually see on the screen. What Campbell is more interested in is the connotation right. or what those things represent. That makes a lot of sense to me. Like if 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 we if we're telling a story and we want to we want to broadcast that we made the story up, we want everybody to know that it's a made up story. We call it a fiction. If if we're right. telling a story and we're communicating a meaning with the story and the meaning is the important thing, we call it a myth. If we if we give that mm -hmm. tax exemption, we call it a, a religion. And and, 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 and if, <laughs> right. And if right. It, and if it becomes a universal if it becomes a universal myth that we're all agreeing to, then it's a so, it, it's a, a social construct like money. Like money is also a myth, but we all agree we all agree to work in that system. So this is this is a very important distinction, right. I think, because like like I, I sometimes get into trouble because I'll talk about the mythology of Christianity or Judaism, and I don't I don't when I say that I'm not meaning that it's fake. What I mean is that there is a there, there are deeply meaningful patterns and stories that are embedded in religion. And so like in, in Christianity, a, a frequent um, myth is hubris, fall, and redemption. That is a, a commonality you see throughout the yeah. Bible. And so when we talk about that, I, when I say that that's a myth, I don't mean that it's – I'm not trying to like smack people's faith down. What I, what I mean is we're, we're dealing with this underlying extremely important sacred tale that that is being broadcast right and uh and it's cool because i think star wars is effectively like a a cool new modern myth uh that likewise has Absolutely. these these yeah these these sacred stories that we decided like these are important these touch the human experience we need to broadcast these we're going to do it with lasers laser swords exactly and that's the denotation that's to draw us in but that's not that's not what keeps us right. with Star Wars. What keeps us is those those levels of connotation, right. the, what's under the surface, um, what Campbell calls the transparent to the transcendent, mm -hmm. um, that mythology should be putting us in touch, uh, both with um, those deep uh, 
the the collective unconscious that's deep within us, and then also uh, metaphysically with um, some sense of spirituality out in the world, mm -hmm. and that the two of those are ultimately one. And so I think what you're commenting on is is how this story template arises in in different cultures um, that use different culturally specific symbols to convey what Campbell says is a, a universal motif. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that he discusses that is mythogenetic zones. Uh, he thinks that um, stories arise um, from the collective unconscious. And, and so the archives are these patterns um, that are to Campbell universal, but that the articulation of those patterns is um, shaped by the region of the people who are telling those stories. So for Campbell, um, whenever, whenever we went to space, that changed everything. Mm. Because when we were able to see the broadcast picture on all of our televisions, I wasn't alive, um, but we were able to see the picture of Earth with no boundaries uh, from space. Right. Uh, we, we all entered a new mythogenetic zone. Mm -hmm. And so mythology always happens beyond the frontier. It's always over, over the hill or across the lake, something like that. But once we were able to see that there are no divisions on the earth, we had to find a new frontier. And so there was something like a decade between that broadcast of uh, the earth rise from the moon and then Star Wars coming out in a, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Ah. So for Cam, so it, it's exactly what you're saying. For Campbell, putting this mythological schema into um, a, a new frontier facilitates our new global mythogenetic zone. And, and I'm, I'm gathering from you too that that myths then are while there is a a kind of um, really deep collective inertia to them, they are at the same time organic. Uh, like like presumably pre presumably the advent of nuclear warfare. Um, would create or, or allow for certain myths to rise because now, um, you know, w warfare is potentially an extinction event uh, or, or space travel you brought up um, or, or for that matter, other things. I mean, like many of the social developments we've had over the last couple hundred years of like women get to own stuff. <laughs> and like, uh, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Every, everybody and gets to vote regardless of skin color. Yeah. Like, like those, those are all like, right. like there's yeah. going to be new myths that arise because of those changes in society. So when, when we're talking specifically about the hero's journey with Joseph Campbell, um, with, with him specifically, because he's the one that directly influenced George Lucas, what is the hero's journey? And and my thought is that maybe you could give us a quick synopsis, and then once you do, you and I can go kind of beat through beat uh, of Star Wars and show, like, this is actually a, a very, very conscious attempt to harness that mythological energy. Right, yeah. So um, Campbell's most basic description of the hero's journey is a three-part structure of departure, initiation, and return. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that's his um, <laughs> simplest explanation of it. But then uh, when you go through Hero with a Thousand Faces, I, I bookmarked this page, uh, but you can see he, he subdivides all of those stages and then there, there are variables right. and options. It, get, it gets a lot more complex. And there's also, we, we can right. also slot in archetypes and things like that. But the very, very basic form, the most rudimentary form of the hero's journey is... Uh, Joe Everyman is summoned to deal with a problem. He deals with the problem. He comes back and through conquering said problem, he has a greater sense of power or magic or accomplishment. And, and like, like, like just, just like as a very, cause I, now that I'm thinking about this, I can see this in so many different films. Um, so w w without going down a rabbit trail on them, like, I don't know why Willow is popping into my mind, but Willow, the, the, uh, the like 1988, uh, uh, fantasy romp with uh, with little people in it. Um, w Willow's village is, is under threat. He goes and you know uh, fights the bad guy, and then he comes back. And he comes back not as like you know the the kind of pubescent uh, 
uh, shrugging guy, he comes back as the hero and is like, no, like there's a moment at the very end of Willow where um, at the beginning, this magician would come to town every year and go, which which of my fingers has the magic in it? And and everybody would point and go, I, and, he, and everybody got it wrong. And then when Willow gets back, he holds up his own finger and he says, this is the finger with magic in it. And the guy goes, yes. And then he becomes the magician. Perfect. He's he's learned it. And that's that arc of hero. That's wonderful. Rise to adventure, uh, all of that stuff. But but like I think Star Wars specifically really, really nails it. So uh, let's yeah, let's go through some of these things uh, of um, of of these these beats in Star Wars. So you 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 do uh, you start out with an ordinary character, right? Like he, he might be a he, he's right. not really a hero. He's like a proto hero. He's he's a farm boy or uh, uh, just a dude or a kid, usually a teenager. He could be you or me. And, and that's important for Campbell. Right. Campbell deviates from some of his mythological predecessors. Um, like Lord Raglan thought that the hero had to be royalty. And so Campbell, like Odysseus. It, it was important for Campbell. Yeah, exactly. And Odysseus is the model of the Jungian um, hero's journey, which Campbell is still under the umbrella right. of, of uh, Jungian psychology here. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Odysseus, versus uh, Oedipus would be the model of the Freudian hero's journey. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and the Freudian hero's journey is concerned with um, the first half of life, whereas the Jungian and the and Campbell's hero's journey are much more concerned with the second half of life. So the hero is already established. Mm-hmm. Luke is already 19 years old when we meet him. Right. Uh, Odysseus is already married um, and before he takes his journey elsewhere. And so... Um, yeah, so Luke is established, even though he doesn't like where he is. But we, we can all feel a rapport with Luke and that Luke is not a, he, yeah. Luke, Luke is not royalty. Luke is none of these things. Luke, Luke is right. basically in Arizona or in Kansas. He's, he's, he literally is a, he's literally yeah. a farm kid <laughs> in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and, and he's just, he's, he's just, yeah, he's, he's doing, he's kind of bored, but he's just there. Uh, and then there's a call to adventure. Right. And adventure right. finds yes, him. Yes, exactly. Yeah, he he wants to go searching for There's, adventure, and that that's part of why he is um, so upset with being so far from the bright center of the galaxy. Uh, and it, adventure comes to him in the form of C three PO and R two D two, who have escaped the battle that Luke has no no idea about, um, and they just they the Jawas sell them these droids. Uh, which is, you know, kind of R2 finagling his way towards Obi-Wan. Um, but but Luke has no idea what's going on. So so that call to adventure, uh, Campbell would call this the animal lure, even though that, that animal is actually R2-D2. When, when Luke takes off his restraining bolt and R2 wanders away across the desert, that would be the animal lure, that Luke is being lured towards this adventure by an animal that he is in and that'd pursuit be kind of. of like the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland or I'm just, I'm just I'm assuming in older stories it's probably Absolutely. probably an actual animal that people are following of you know a, 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 they go right. hunting a deer there's a particularly good deer or something and it and it draws them into the wilderness right in our Arthurian legend that happens um and so what again? Remember, this is the new mythogenetic zone, so it doesn't actually have to be an animal in our our new understanding of the world um, in the seventies and beyond at this point. Uh, but that's the 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 connotative um, form that's being expressed through the denotative symbol of R two D two is the animal lore. So that's that's how Luke's adventure starts, and then he tries to. Um, deny the call to adventure, which is something that Campbell deals with. Um, whenever the sand people attack and Obi-Wan saves him. Um, and then he, you know, Luke, before he goes back, I mean, this is all spoilers. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if, if anyone out I, there I hasn't. Think, I think it, it, anybody listening to this program has probably <laughs> seen Star Wars a couple dozen times. Oh, I sure hope so. Uh, so, so whenever Luke um, tells Obi-Wan he can't go with him to Alderaan. That's the refusal mm. of the call, according to Campbell. And Obi-Wan says, you must do what you think is right. Um, and, and then it's once he goes back and sees that there's nothing left for him because the stormtroopers have, have killed his family, um, that's when he finally, ultimately, 
he accepts that and, call. And, and, and we and 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 this just to, for people listening that are unfamiliar with it, this is not some uh, uh, neither Professor Schlesinger Schlesinger uh, nor myself are are implying that this is um, just applicable to Star Wars. Like I'm thinking of like The Hobbit. Uh, like Bilbo Baggins right. is just this right. kind of oh, lazy, serotonin infused, you know, pot bellied dude. And yeah. the dwarves show up and they're like, get your bag. We're going to fight the dragon. Uh, and there's this sort of like n- right. normalcy and the, the, the mundane quotidian existence are broken into by some external force that says things are not right. And we need you to come help us fix this thing. Absolutely. And Bilbo tries to refuse the mm-hmm. call as well. But then his better nature um catches up with him the next day and he runs out the door after Thorin's mm-hmm. company. Um, and, and then turns out that he was the only one that could have, um, uh, accomplished this great feat of, uh, uh, you know, tricking. And, 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 in, and in uh, the Lord of the Rings, uh, trilogy, um, there is a mentor figure, um, who they're, they're, they're likewise in the Lord of the Rings. There's the, you know, uh, like you, you've got uh, Bilbo in, in The Hobbit and then you've got, um, I don't know Tolkien nearly as well, but you've got his nephew in Lord of the Rings and you've got Gandalf, who is the old sagely mentor figure who shepherds this person towards the future. And in Star Wars, we have Obi-Wan Kenobi show up on the scene and and literally give a weapon Absolutely. and training and magic uh, to the to his new charge. Right. And and so the force the Obi-Wan is it starts to put Luke in touch with the force. And this is what makes Star Wars so special, um, because there's kind of this um, meta awareness of what Campbell is saying with the hero's journey. The hero's journey is always ultimately a mystic act of uh, union of the apotheosis, which, you know, spoiler alert, that's where we're going at the end of this hero journey cycle is uh, apotheosis in return with this ultimate boon. Uh, but the fusion of outside and inside, the the union of opposites, and we already start to get that from Obi-Wan um, when he starts talking to Luke about the Force. It binds us, it penetrates us. Uh, he is already starting to use this uh, non-dual language, um, which for Campbell was really important. Uh, Campbell, he used the words time and eternity, as a uh, uh, binary thought structure often. But uh, what he's dealing with is transcendence and imminence. And, and for Campbell, transcendence is embedded in imminence or eternity is embedded in time. The two are not separate. Um, uh, eternity is not elsewhere. Eternity is here and now. And we see Lucas representing this with the way that he discusses the force, that the force is all around us all the time and it's, it's not somewhere else we have to go to. So the other world that Luke is going to is, is a, a level of perception that he is trying to awaken, that Obi-Wan is trying to trigger for him so that he can recognize that the force is around him all the time. And that's the ultimate. So he, he's he's that learning he that it's for. not a physical location that he's trying to get to, but rather an internal state that he's becoming right. aware of. Um, and you see this reflected in right. other things, again, not to be pejorative, but like Buddhism, um, like like Buddha means one who yeah. is awake, um, like B- Buddha is not right. Buddha is not Absolutely. physically getting to nirvana. Buddha is achieving enlightenment in this life. Um, and and uh, and and you you and I'll add to that. I like when I think of Obi Wan Kenobi, I think of the prototypical mentor figure. Like I, I use, I, I think everybody uses Obi Wan Kenobi as a verbal touchstone for like, oh, that's the Obi Wan Kenobi of such and such. This is like the the wise old man who is the elder statesman of this particular thing. Uh, that's Obi Wan, as opposed to Yoda, who's like the you know like like the the, yes. the Buddha character, like the kind of sublime. Uh, um, repository of knowledge or, or something. I, I don't know if, if there are distinctions right. between the two in the mythological cycle, but but uh, but Obi Wan Kenobi is definitely fulfilling that old sagely mentor figure that that Gandalf. Uh, and I, I imagine were we to go through um, a number of other things, we'd probably find that same figure pop up um, throughout science fiction and throughout throughout myth- mythology. Or, or like uh, you you mentioned Arthurian legend. There's Merlin, right? So like like uh-huh. like. Right. Ar- exactly. Ar- Ar- Arthur, exactly. Arthur gets a sword, you know, just as Luke gets a lightsaber, and uh, and then he's got this this uh, this this wizard who is his mentor figure. Um, cool. Hadn't made that right. connection. Feeling good about this. 
it's it's yeah. pretty neat. Well, and then, okay, and then one of the things that uh, I I think this happens in Star Wars. I I watched uh, several of the videos that that you would uh, recommend. There's there's a series. Um, uh, with Bill Moyer from, I think, PBS in the 1980s, where Bill Moyer is interviewing uh, Joseph Campbell at uh, Skywalker Ranch. Uh, so I think George Lucas just offered to host because he's, he's such a fan. And um, right. what, one, of the, one of the beats that um, Joseph Campbell talks about in general mythology is that at the beginning of this hero's journey, there's an ogre who's, who provides a sort of minimal resistance to the hero. It's not the big bad guy that's really going to make him think it's it's the the kind of you know level one Mario brother bad guy that you can knock down without too much problem, but he does present this sort of psychic speed bump. So like in Star Wars, would that be would right. that whether it be the Sand People or would it be the uh, the guy at uh, at the cantina that that threatens Luke before he gets his arm cut off? Like like is it one of those things? I, yeah, I think it's I think it's the latter, or at least in in my conception of it, uh, the cantina, the the. Um, archetype that you're talking about here is the threshold guardian threshold guardian perfect yes yeah the threshold guardian and uh the cantina is the mm -hmm. threshold because that's that's the place you know you have never seen a more wretched hive of scum and villainy uh because luke's been living out in the desert on mm -hmm. this farm uh harvesting moisture his entire life and now he's going into the mm -hmm. spaceport and here are all of these people from all around the galaxy that people and creatures, I guess, uh, from all around the galaxy, all of, all of these things that Luke has never seen before. Uh, and he has to try not to stare. And so this is, this is elsewhere confronting him. This is the, the first step of his journey, um, which, you know, then Obi-Wan eventually tells him you've taken your first steps into a larger world when he uh, has the blast shield down and he's feeling the force because star Wars is, uh, it, it seems so simple, but it's really, it's, it's managing these moving parts like spinning mm -hmm. plates. So at the one time it's conveying to us about the imminence of transcendence through the, through teaching us the metaphor of the force, by the way, metaphor be with you, <laughs> right? Metaphors be with you. Um, so at the, at, on the one hand, Luke is learning that this transcendence is everywhere. And on the other hand, he is actually departing and going yeah, and the, elsewhere. And the cantina is the the literal like the, the cantina is the literal threshold point. It's the it's it's the it's exactly. the, the the it's the edge. It's the the wall, right? It's it's the point right. which um, right. I'm going to go past this and I'm leaving the familiar and I'm going into something else. And the people at it have have lived in it. Like in, in a lot of Robert Heinlein's novels, the protagonist will um, will go to like a bar or a truck stop or something, and all the dudes there are like grizzled people that have have been out. They've been out of the frontier and they know what it's like. And it, yeah, seen and they, they, the kid is encountering these people, and that's that's what Luke is tasting when he goes to the cantina, and then he goes off from there, and then. And um, I'm going to get right. my chronology wrong, but I feel like in, in most myths, um, and particularly in religious myths, um, there is a, a sense that in order to achieve spiritual heightening, you have to go into the, into the wilderness by yourself. So Buddha goes into the forest. Jesus goes into the desert. Uh, Jesus, uh, I think yeah. Muhammad probably goes into the desert, or I think Muhammad goes into a cave. Um, so th th there's this usual sense of like like leaving civilization and leaving the comfort and going into sort of the the primeval wilderness. And I, I think in Star Wars that would be Luke yeah. going to Dagobah. He's literally going to a swamp. He's going to this very earthy place uh, that's you know f full of monsters and darkness and and you know overgrowth. Right. And, and right, he's getting right. his spiritual training right. there. Absolutely. And so we, we jumped for, for those who haven't seen Star Wars, we jumped to Empire <laughs> right, Strikes right. Back here. Uh, but what's happening is uh, Dagobah is such a wonderful addition to the, the Star Wars canon. Um, and so uh, Lucas is really aware of names to start with. So Obi-Wan Kenobi, and, and Obi is a samurai huh. stash. Um, and so, and Obi-Wan, if we think about him compared to some of the other Jedi we meet, he is, he is right. a warrior, um, uh, like, like a samurai who follows orders. He, he's always butting heads with Qui-Gon about following the Jedi council's orders because he's on that side, uh, the, the, um, more aggressive side of the Jedi order versus Qui-Gon is more 
uh, contemplative. Yeah. He's like a Shaolin and monk or something like th- that. We see the we see the same thing. Exactly, exactly, and um, it, we see that manifest in the color of the lightsaber blades. So those who are more on the um, meditative side will have a green lightsaber blade, and those who are more on the warrior side will have a blue lightsaber blade. And it, of course, Yoda's is green as well. And so Dagobah. This is a long way around to saying what Dagobah means. Uh, a Dagobah is a type of pagoda, which is a, a Buddhist really? temple. Really? Huh, I did not know that. And so, yeah. Oh, I totally. just figured it was a made-up name. But, like, but, but Dagobah is an actual Buddhist term for, for a pagoda? Okay. Or a type of pagoda? Right. And so, it, which is uh, relatively unknown to our culture, especially in 1980 sure. when that movie came out. I mean, I, I, like, like, yeah, Ryan, Ryan, I go to Sangha. Uh, like I go to Buddhist sagas on a regular basis outside of quarantine. Okay. I didn't know that. Excellent. <laughs> so if I didn't know that, they definitely didn't know it in 1980 in America. Yeah. Right. Yeah, totally. Well, and, uh, you, you know, I was really interested um, in Eastern philosophy as well. And, and he's dealing with uh, Eastern philosophy as well as Western. And, and, you know, one of Campbell's definitions for myth is just other people's mm, religion. Yeah. Uh, that's kind of his tongue in cheek. It's just the way that we focus on these stories. Um, so, yeah, Dagobah is a pagoda. Uh, other things like Padme, you're probably aware of uh, Padme, it means lotus. Like, Om Mani Padme huh. Om, hail to the jeweled lotus. Okay. Uh, so, that the, these names are meant to convey something about the characters and locations. Is, 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 the, is the fact that it's Luke Skywalker and George Lucas, was he in, interpolating himself into it? Yeah. Like, is that, do you think, why you picked Luke then? Yeah. I, it never even occurred to me until you kept calling totally. him Lucas. And I was like, I wonder if that was him. That'd be like me calling a protagonist, <laughs> like, like Heater, yeah. like, like George Heater or something. Uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. There you go. You already yeah. got your. I can, I can, and now that I know myth, I can. I can make a multi-billion-dollar <laughs> industry out of this. Well, so, yeah. so, so to leap back, I apologize. I, I got a, a little bit ahead of us chrono, chrono, uh, huh. chronologically. What, one of the other things that um, that Joseph Campbell talks about, and I don't know if he if he talks about this explicitly in the interviews that you sent me, but he he does talk about how in a lot of these myths, there's a a point where the protagonist meets a goddess, and when he meets the goddess, she is. Um, someone like Artemis, uh, or or maybe Athena, but you, usually a kind of like a beautiful virginal goddess who's a little bit aloof, and she's sleeping or she's you know resting in a field or something like that. And uh, and I was thinking about it, and I was like, well, then is that is it intentional that when he meets Leia, she is asleep in this holding cell? Is she meant to be a kind of Diana? And if so, she didn't turn out to be a goddess the rest of the time, but is he just wanting to like kind of make that touchstone? Right. Well, I, I think so. And I think, I think you're dead on there, but I also think this is one of the places that we see uh, Lucas pushing forward this mythological mm-hmm. schema uh, to represent this new time. Uh, feminism has taken hold in America by the 1970s. And, you know, uh, Campbell's book was written in 1949. And uh, some of the gender relations to, uh, you know, to put it nicely, some of the gender relations in his book are sure. outdated well, and by f- the time f- f- the C- Campbell's a guy who, in the 80s, when he's doing this interview with Bill Moyer, is calling Star Wars a talkie. Like, he literally refers to Star yeah. Wars as a talkie. Like, he is clearly, he seems like yeah. a really nice guy. Uh, he's, I, 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 I guess he was a, an English or literature professor at Sarah Lawrence College, which I believe was an all-women's college at the time. So right. prob- probably in his right. day, I'm sure he was very, very kind and very open-minded and everything. But he is coming out of an older environment. And, and, uh, and, and, and I do think yeah. he has kind of my read on it. I, I do think that his interpretation of the hero's journey is very male-centric. Um, so, uh, and I, and I don't mean that as a bad thing. I don't think that we should get rid of it. I think that it's just that there's other schemas that you can look at. So like, if we're looking at say like Cinderella, right. which is a female centric story, um, Cinderella is going off and she's the heroine. Um, she encounters these things and she comes back and she transforms society. Whereas with, with the hero's journey with Campbell's model, the, the hero goes off um, to protect his homeland or whatever the thing is from an external threat comes back and he saves it. So like in, in his stories, it's typically about saving or restoring the kingdom. Whereas like a female type model, I think tends to be more, I'm going to transform the kingdom. And he's coming more from that, like I'm going to save it type thing. But, but I'm really getting 
uh, beyond my pay grade in doing that. Well, sure. And, and, but then we also see, we see once Disney got a hold of um, Star Wars, we see Ray become the main right. protagonist. Yeah. And so like we can chart uh, our culture's development over the last 43 years. Uh, based on how Star Wars develops. And uh, one thing that Lucas does, and, and Campbell accepts it and loves it, uh, is, is he gives the princess her own right. agency. She acts for herself. Uh, the hero doesn't save the princess. The princess saves the hero. Uh, and that was, that's a big step out, step away from Campbell's um, uh, prescribed motif, but it, it pushes right. it forward. And then that leads us eventually to Ray becoming the hero. And like you said, Campbell's schema is male centric. Um, what he is commenting on is millennia of human experience uh, in this repository deep inside us, it, which is now starting to shift and has been shifting for 50 years now. And so uh, those archetypes are shifting as well. And, and we're seeing Star Wars commenting on this um, uh, I recently found out that Disney went with, you know, I know there's a lot of critics of this new uh, trilogy, but Disney did honor uh, Lucas's kernel of the idea, which was to see an old Luke Skywalker training a young female. Oh, and that was something Lucas wanted to do. And so they took it their yeah. direction. That was something Lucas wanted to do. And we don't, we know that he wrote, he had the storyline for all nine right. before he ever created the mm -hmm. first Star Wars. Uh, and I don't know if we'll ever see the fleshed out scripts that, that Disney didn't use, but we know that that kernel of the idea is what they went forward with. Interesting, yeah. Well, and, and, and you raise a great point with, with, uh, with Princess Leia, because in, in these older mythologies, the, the princess is a, she is a damsel in distress character, and she is to be rescued and right. saved and right. treasured, and she's beautiful, but she faints a lot, uh, and, and she really has no agency mm -hmm. in it, and she's, mm -hmm. you know, she's Rapunzel locked in the tower, where she's, she's, uh, she's the harp that the, o yeah, Guinevere. she's Guinevere, she's the, in, uh, in Jack and the Beanstalk, she's the, the beautiful singing harp that is yeah. literally an object owned by an ogre right. and must be rescued, uh, but, but she's not, she, she's being hoisted over the shoulders of the hero, whereas you're right, in Star Wars it's very different, uh, Leia's the badass. Leia is Leia is starting as yeah. the the moving you know guerrilla fighter force, and Luke is coming in late. Uh, he's he's he initially rescues her, but he's not coming in as the um, is is the action hero, uh, you know Bruce Willis character saving the 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 fainting blonde. Um, he's he's releasing the warrior princess right. who's been trapped, and then she goes on to do her own stuff. Yeah, absolutely, and it, it, it's uh, it's audacious to Han. Like look at Han's re reaction. To Leia's attitude whenever he first meets her, it's it's totally different than what he expected. But of course, they end up falling in love, um, which is its its own archive as well, or archive, excuse me, its own archetype mm -hmm. as well. Um, I, I do want to go back to Dagobah. Sure. At some oh, yeah, point. Please, so, do you want oh, to no, keep no, working? No, uh, go ahead these, and um, go, go ahead and finish that thought, or, or let's talk about it rather than having to swing back. Yeah. Okay. So so Dagobah Buddhist temple, Buddhist pagoda. Um, and when you go there, like you said, there, it, it's dark, it's steamy. There are all these monsters. Uh, this was Lucas's representation of the unconscious oh. in a physical place on, on the film. And you think about Luke having to go into the dark side cave on Dagobah. So first when he lands, he can't find ground and he, you know, crash lands into the water. Uh, it's all murky. Uh, this is, he's reflecting what psychologists, what Jungian psychologists are saying about the unconscious, that it's so far down there. It's, it's dark. Uh, Campbell always talks about going into the abyss to find your treasure. And, uh, and, and this is the journey. This is the metaphorical journey that Luke is taking way down into the unconscious. He's actually physically taking that journey in Empire Strikes Back to, um, to, to Dagobah to encounter these monsters, these huge forms that are underneath the surface that we don't really know what they are um they're kind of in in indistinct um, hazy, vaporous right. figures that represent yeah, re represent exactly. there's something behemoth but not quite um clearly delineated afoot right yeah uh, that's a wonderful way to put it uh and 
And so when he goes down into the dark side cave, when he goes down into this cave, what we see he eventually encounters, which uh, was above my head when I first started watching Star Wars when I was right, you know, yeah. three years old or whatever, uh, he encounters himself. And so that's what Campbell, that, that again goes back to Campbell, that when you go down deep in, inside, what you're actually finding is your own self, your own, he would call it your authentic self. Um, and that we're trying to find these patterns of our existence to align with those patterns. And that is, I, I just love how poetic, um, Lucas reflects that on the screen with that, that whole Dagobah sequence is really just this kind of depth psychology of Luke going way down in himself, finding himself there, but then also being scared of himself and his own potentiality. Um, and, as, as far as that goes, uh, all of Star Wars, all of the meaning is on the surface. So, like, if we think about how Luke appears, when Luke appears in uh, Episode 4, he's wearing all white. When Luke appears on Dagobah, he's wearing all gray. And then when Luke appears in Return of the Jedi, he's wearing all black. And these are this is a significant wardrobe uh, change in order to show his progression on this path. And we can also look at this based on the web. Wait, like, like, in, 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 like, when, when you say he's progressing, do you mean in the sense that, like, you start out as a white belt and you wind up a black belt? Like, is it that kind? Like, is it's like, is it an expertise progression? Where because I assume it's not saying that he's going from good to bad, going from white to black. I assume it's a different. I don't think it's saying he's going from light to dark. It's saying that it, it's levels right. of okay, experience. Yeah. So, like, like white belt to black belt, but also. Um, he's, he's awakening to the potential for darkness in himself when he's on Dagobah. And that's startling to him. That's the monster that's under the surface that he's encountering. Um, but then in the final episode, you know, uh, excuse me, after he leaves Dagobah, he, he ends up finding out that Darth Vader is, is his father and that this, this horrible thing going to the dark side can literally happen to anyone, including Luke, which is why he's being uh, reflected in this gray outfit. And so once he's in Return of the Jedi, he's wearing all black because he's embraced this realization that the light and the dark are inside all of us at all time. Uh, and that is what ultimately saves him from going to the dark side. Uh, if we look at Anakin's characterization in the prequel trilogy, uh, we see that he is a very binary mm -hmm. thinker. Um, and he puts a lot of pressure on himself to stay entirely in the light the whole time, and he can't do it, and he's manipulated, and so he cracks, and he goes all the way to the dark side. But Luke, uh, Luke has uh, grown into this awareness, uh, partly because Obi-Wan has grown in his understanding of the Force in the 19 years he was in solitude, and Yoda has grown as well. And so they're able to teach him um, to recognize the light and the dark at work inside you all the time. And, and this is an important point again, because Lucas is, is trying to convey, uh, what, what Campbell's saying about mythology. Campbell's idea of mythology is that the whole thing is a, a psychodrama. Everything in mythology represents, or excuse me, everything in a myth represents the psychological forces inside our own head. And so when we're seeing a story, uh, or listening to a story, we're actually encountering the the types of forces that are going on in our own psychology all the time. And so Lucas is showing Luke dealing with this. So, you know, like we, we kind of miss the point when we say, oh, I, I prefer the light side to the dark side, or like, I really like Luke Skywalker, I really like Ray, or I like Darth Vader, or I like Kylo Ren, because what Lucas is saying um, is what Campbell is saying is that you're all of them all yeah. the time. You have all of those forces in your head. The, the, the galaxy far, far away is actually between your ears all the time. This is why it reflects back. There's, so I, I can't remember the name of the, the philosopher, but there was a wonderful quote I read this last year where I, it might have been Viktor Frankl. It might have been. I can't remember. But he made a point that um, a lot of the time we, we tend to think of evil as a line between groups that there's the good group and the bad group and that in reality evil's a line that goes through you that we all have we all have 
bad elements yeah. to our, our our inner nature, and we we have to be aware right. of them. And that when we when we begin to conceive of the world as a line in the sand, and we're on the good side of that line, and the bad people are on the other side of that line, that is right. a, a false dichotomy that Anakin was subject to, as opposed to the more realistic one Absolutely. that like, no, I've got some bad stuff in me that I need to deal with, and I need to be aware that while I might be fighting somebody else. Right. I the the seeds that I'm fighting in them is something that I need to be aware of in me, uh, and it sounds like this is that's the worldview exactly. that that Luke Skywalker is is inhabiting over the course of this arc of of being aware of this inner darkness and being able to accommodate himself to a world in which that happens so he he doesn't right. break the way Anakin does. Yeah, that that's the only way that he overcomes it. Uh, and so when when we see how people are um, receiving the messages of Star Wars. Um, we, we, we want them to, to see it psychologically uh, because, like you mentioned, the, the line between good people and bad people, we often, I, I don't know, I see this on Facebook all the time, or like that we're the rebels fighting the evil empire or, that, or something like that. Um, but that is drawing a line between right. groups of people, which is very yeah. dangerous. That's, you know, uh, mythology has been weaponized mm-hmm. in the past. Uh, like if you if you think about the Nazis, they use bulkish mythology to create that very firm line between different groups of people. And that is the last thing that Campbell wants with teaching us about mythology. He does not want that sociological application. What he wants is us to take that psychological application and realize those forces inside of us and have our own internal Luke Skywalkers overcome our own internal dark side. That is amazing. And I think a, a really good way to look at, at Star Wars, because like I, um, um, you know, so I kick around various um, various approaches on the show. I really like getting into the underlying worldview of science fiction. And a lot of the time we'll, we'll focus on one particular aspect of it. So like with Dune, uh, we did an episode on Dune where we talked a lot about the economics of Dune because, um, you know, spice is kind of a corollary for oil. Um, and there's a lot of like 1970s political economy that works its way into Dune. And um, Star Wars, there are political motifs in it because uh, there are little w- winks and nudges that Lucas does, like the the ship that General Grievous has is the uh, the Invisible Hand. So he's, uh, you know, L- Lucas is firing yeah. shots at neoliberalism and taking his crack at Adam Smith. Right. And so it's tempting to kind of look at it as a political exegesis. And while there are political elements to it, I think it is a, a much better way to look at it of this is a, a deeply psychological and mythological explanation of things that's the story that we're getting into absolutely but i think that um those references are intentional um and and that it's meant to be multivalent it's meant to um be applied externally as well as internally uh just the ultimate the ultimate takeaway is the psychological but i think you know the prequel trilogy got really political and i think that was on purpose. Um, I had read an interview with George Lucas, uh, a long time ago. And he said the, the original trilogy was meant to explore friendship. Uh, the prequel trilogy was meant to explore politics and the sequels. This is after the prequels. And he had said, I'm never doing another one. Uh, the sequels at that point, had he been working towards them would have been about philosophy. And I, I do think that Disney honored that wish with the sequel trilogy. Uh, I think that um, episode eight, um, The Last Jedi, got really deep into explaining some of this light and dark within the single character um, with with Luke's lessons that he passes on mm. to Rey. Even if it's only three lessons, they were three really important okay. lessons. Phenomenal. Be- before we lose an entire track of the the, the actual <laughs> hero's journey, because there's lots of stuff for us to pick apart. Uh, oh yeah. Um, a, 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 a couple of other beats uh, that take place in the hero's journey. Um, the the hero. I, I want to say the chronology goes something like the hero um, gets his ragtag gang of friends together. He meets the bad guy. He uh-huh. loses to the bad guy. He licks his wounds. Um, it right. looks like it looks like he's everybody's screwed. And he makes a huge risk and defeats the bad guy. Is is that an approximate way of describing right. the rest of that arc? Totally. And so uh, those would apply to meeting mm-hmm. Han and Chewie. And then he's got this just really diverse yeah. group of people with uh, with the the self saving princess, the pirate that doesn't care about anyone else, the lovable best friend dog creature, <laughs> um, the, the, and the, 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 the old the man neurotic robot hate. butler. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so, and, you know, the depiction of the neurotic robot butler and R2-D2 is important as well because they, they reflect the levels of consciousness. And if you think about it, uh, like R2-D2 never communicates directly to the characters. He always has to be interpreted by C-3PO. And so C-3PO represents the conscious mind and R2-D2 represents the unconscious. Uh, so we, we as an audience never really know exactly what R2-D2 is saying. We just get the translation through different characters. Uh, and it, whenever um, the two droids split up, R2 always goes with Luke who's on his journey to explore the unconscious and C-3PO goes with the more pragmatic character. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, I lost the track again. Oh, okay. So, uh, crossing the first threshold, the, the belly of right, the beast, yes. when they go into, they go into the death star and they, they slide down the garbage chute and they find themselves in, uh, this trash compactor with, with no bottom, I mean, this is a reoccurring motif that we see these watery locations with these monsters that we can't see beneath them. So like, like jo- jo- Jonah on the whale is what Im- immediately jumps into my mind. Of, of, of jo- exactly. Jonah is swallowed by a whale, he's yeah. inside the whale. They, they are in the Death Star. They're not just right. in the Death Star, they're in what appears to be like actual guts. Because, uh, you know, it's all wet and there's stuff moving yeah, around. Exactly. And now they're, they're truly in the middle of the thing, yeah. Right. And so that would, that's the, you know, after he's crossed the threshold is like, well, here goes nothing. I'm just going to plunge all the way in and we find him in the belly of the beast. Uh, and then, so he, in that movie, uh, is not defeated. It's in empire strikes back where he's, he's defeated or a momentary Mm -hmm. defeat by Darth Vader. Uh, but it's really just the, the psychic shock of realizing that he is related to this person to space. Again, space Hitler's is dead. (laughs) Yeah, space, space Hitler's his dad, yeah. Uh, Anakin, meaning he is akin. That's ah. where that name comes from. So we were supposed to know that. And then, you know, Darth Vader translates to Dark Father in um, oh. Latin. And so there, there are hints that Lucas Whoa. gives us that we shouldn't have been. I know. <laughs> okay, cool. How yeah. about that? Um, and, okay, yeah. so, so he has that. He has the temporary setback. You're, you're right. This takes place over over three films. It's not just one film, uh, although the, you know each of them f- f- seems fulfilling in its own way. Um, he he eventually uh, he eventually defeats uh, Vader, but it, but in the first one, just in A New Hope, or I say first one, in terms of the actual timeline of our universe, the, you know what I mean. I know. Uh, episode four, A New Hope. Um, the the kind of pivotal victory moments when he blows up the Death Star, and he does it by letting go of all of the gadgets and uh, accepting the right. force. So what what is being communicated there? Because exactly. I, like, I want to say that that's, I, I feel like I've heard Joseph Campbell talk about something akin to that, but I, I want to hear your interpretation on it. Joseph Campbell talks specifically about that moment, um, and, and he talks about hearing reports that people just erupt in applause. Mm-hmm in the movie theater at that moment, which is something that I've experienced at Star Wars movies um, when the the whole theater just erupts in applause, which is, um, it's kind of surreal because the performers aren't there. They can't hear the applause, but everybody's just so overcome by uh, what's happening on the screen that they can't help themselves. So at at that moment, uh, we have another mythological theme is uh, man versus system. And, we see this system, man versus machine, is another way to put that. We, we see this machine, you know, the, the belly, the beast that they find themselves in the belly in is, is a literal machine. It's the largest D- machine Darth that's ever Vader's been created. Darth Vader is a man who has been cannibalized by machine. Absolutely, right. And that's, the dark side has taken him over because he couldn't resist um, putting himself in service of the system, not not what can the system do for him. He hasn't retained mm-hmm. his humanity. And so that's why we see Vader as this machine. So sort, sort of like, like, like if, if we're using like sort of, sort of like humanity versus cold artifice or something like that of this sort of like, like cold inhuman yeah. calculation. Cause the, you know, there, there's this, there's, the system's not right. necessarily bad, but when you exist for the benefit of the system, it is bad and it's soul crushing. Uh, and, you right. lose your humanity. Okay. For, for Campbell, the ultimate meaning of myth is to 
or the ultimate use of myth is to help us live a human life. And, and he sees uh, myth helping us do that by putting us in touch with the patterns of human life that have existed for millennia before us. Um, and, and so Darth Vader going over to the dark side, becoming more machine than man now, as, as Obi-Wan puts it, is, uh, is, is a terrible defeat because he has foregone his own humanity. And so what we see in that moment when Luke turns off his uh, targeting computer is his reliance on himself, his reliance in, in, on intuition, this mystical and, yeah, energy yeah, field. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, the depth of his unconscious the, uh, that is also um, connected to this mystical energy field that surrounds us and permeates us. And he relies on his humanity, think, thinking of humanity um, in, in an expanded way. So there's a spiritual component to humanity as well as this deeply psychological component in Campbell's um, idea of humanity. And he has this, this really mystical moment where through doing that, he is able to uh, turn the course of those missiles into the exhaust vent uh, which is not something he would have been able to do with his targeting. And, and is, is the fact that by the end of this, that, that Luke, you know, his arm is cut off and he has a robot hand. Is is that is that like a further yeah. uh, manifestation of him being aware of his dual nature? Is that is that him coming to terms Absolutely. with the fact that, yes, he's a man, but he's also a little bit system. He's not wholly the one or the other. Right. OK. Right. Well, and, and also it's a, it's a warning mm. to him. And, you know, in the prequels, we see Anakin's arm get cut off first. Um, but then he, he doesn't heed that warning. He doesn't step back from the path that he's on, um, which has something to do with, um, the way that he's being taught and, and the way that he's lying to his teachers and the world around him about who he is, because he has this secret relationship going on, uh, versus Luke, who's always up front and uh, is always confronting who he is. And then that saves him from going to the dark side versus Anakin it, it's really that deception. He was trying to deceive everyone else, and it ends up that he deceives mm. himself, and that is what led him to his fall in that crisis moment. Um, so, so the hand, losing the hand, we, we see this uh, portrayed really poetically at the end of Return of the Jedi when Luke has been overcome by his dark side nature um, after Vader has mentioned his sister, and he beats Vader down and then cuts off his mechanical hand and he sees all the wires sticking out and then it focuses on Luke looking at his own mechanical hand. And that's the moment where he drops the lightsaber and says, no, you failed. I'm a Jedi like my father before me, because that provides him with that warning is that he remembers his uh, experience in the dark side cave. And he realizes that he could be on this path towards becoming the next Darth Vader. And that's where he makes his third choice, which is another big um, uh, message for Joseph Campbell in mythology, is that there's always this third way. There's always the way that uh, there's always your own way to go. Uh, and he talks about it in reference to the Knights of the Round Table. Uh, after the Grail mystically appears in uh, hovering over the Round Table and then all the knights set off to go after the Grail, None of them follow any other knight's path, and none of them go on a path that's already created. They all enter the forest at its uh, thickest part, and they carve their own path through. And that's, that's exactly what Luke last moment, where Obi-Wan and Yoda tell him, you have to defeat your father, you have to defeat the emperor. And the emperor tells him, you have to defeat your father. He says, I'm not listening to anyone. I'm going to be true to myself, because I've gone down into the depths of my psychology and I am in touch with myself and this is the right decision for me. And that's the decision that ends up saving himself, his father and the entire yeah. galaxy. Um, on the note of the father, uh, is, is, is that, is there a, either a Jungian archetype of the father figure or alternately does the father figure factor into hero's journey? Like, is that, is that, cause that, that's such a, a deeply, uh, uh, meaningful and recurrent feature within Star Wars that I, I assume that that's not merely a plot point. Right. Is there a mythological element to that as well? There is. Uh, atonement with the Father or Atonement with the Deity. Um, and and Campbell breaks down 
um, the word atonement to at one men, like to, to harmonize with the father. And so that's what, that's what he's trying to do. That's what Luke is trying to do in return of the Jedi when um, he thinks he's endangered the mission because Vader can sense his presence on the forest moon of Endor. And so then he goes and gives himself up to Vader and they have that awkward, but somehow touching moment um, on the, the landing pad after Luke gets off the um, at, at and Vader holds up his lightsaber and says, there's some sense of pride in Vader (laughs) that Luke has created his own lightsaber and, Luke is trying to turn his father back, but his father thinks he's too far gone. But we can already see that he's that Vader is negotiating um, his light and dark side at the same time that Luke is negotiating his light and dark side. So that this is the beginning of that atonement, um, and it's it's that ultimate harmony um, that Campbell talks about as uh, an archetype um, that he sees in all of these stories: uh, atonement with the father or atonement with the deity that leads to the apotheosis and that apotheosis in this instance is Luke realizing the light and dark are both inside him and he has the choice in every minute. And that, that leads to another point that the hero's journey is a macrocosm and a microcosm. Um, so every, every character in star Wars is on their own hero's journey, which is also neat and something new that Lucas is doing. It's not just about the protagonist. Uh, we see Han Solo right. evolve. We see three PO evolve. You know, when when we first meet C three PO, Luke says, "You know about the rebellion? Tell me everything." And three PO says, "There's not much to tell. I'm not very good at telling stories." But at the end of Return of the Jedi, he's holding court and telling all of these stories with sound effects to uh, the Ewoks. So he's gone on his own hero's journey. Every, every character in this is evolving and. Um, and that's a new way of reflecting the hero's journey. It's not just about the protagonist. Um, so yeah, so the apotheosis there is, um, Luke realizing the light and dark side within himself and, and balance. Can I pause you? Cause when I think of apotheosis, I think of like, like, um, I, 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 the, I'm thinking of like Eastern Orthodox theology uh, or, or Greek theology. Like so apotheosis okay. in Greek theology l- literally means the, the, the deification, right? So like if you look at – if you go into the United States Capitol, uh, you look up at the dome, the, the mural there is called the Apotheosis of Washington. So called because he is uh, he is literally amongst the gods in a pantheon, right? So like, like I, I think of right. apotheosis right. as – or, or like, like I, th- I think from like a plot point, it would be like Hercules. Uh, Hercules, when he dies, is subsumed into the heavens. He becomes a god on Mount Olympus. So he's transcended humanity. Is right. it, but it doesn't sound Absolutely. like you're using it quite the same way or I'm misinterpreting your use of it. Well, it, that's because for Campbell, for Lucas, transcendence is embedded in imminence. So this is the moment at which Luke has realized – that he is uh, divine and that that divinity was here inside him and all around him all the time. He is totally at one with the force. He is at one with the light side and dark side. Um, it, the, the myth of the Jedi and the myth of the Sith have fallen away. The Jedi say, just use the light side. The Sith say, just use the dark side. Luke realizes the, the mystic union of these two. So there's a, there's a holism here. Um, that uh, transcendence is not elsewhere. So lifted up to Mount Olympus doesn't exist for Campbell because the transcendent moment happens in the middle of imminence. It's, it's that realization. It's another level of perception added on where we see uh, the divinity that is within us. And he, Campbell goes back to Jesus saying the kingdom of God is within you. Is, is that the imminence you're talking about? You mean, like, when you say imminence, do you mean like Im- immediacy yeah. or in the moment? I, yeah, right. I mean like physical, corporeal nature, that uh, uh, transcendence or divinity, the force, whatever, is, is in, enmeshed okay. in this, in everything. Um, let's, let's pick apart a few of the archetypes that are established within, uh, within Star Wars, in, unless there are any significant elements to the hero's sure. journey that we haven't hit. Um, cause it, there's very possible that I've just forgotten about something or it didn't occur to me, but barring that, uh, we talked about Obi-Wan Kenobi is the mentor figure. He is the sage, right? Uh, right. Luke is the hero. We talked about Leia who is filling that, that 
older mythological archetypical role of the the princess, but she's also kind of a new one. We, it's modified to where she's a heroine. You mentioned right. Han Solo and you said pirate. Right. Is there like a like like I'm thinking of like Dungeons and Dragons? There's a rogue. Like there's the the the, the, the yeah the, 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 the uh, uh, ca- yeah. would it be chaotic not chaotic neutral it would be like I, I'm going to forget all of my D and D stuff but the, but the guy who's self he, I know, he, I know he, he's, he's not malicious but he is self interested he's not he's not evil exactly. but he is in it for himself and that's that's so is is, is that is right. there like the rogue character or the adventurer what is Han Solo is is an archetype yeah that that archetype is the mercenary okay. pirate. And it's exactly what you're describing. But then we we see him go on his own hero journey. And even by the end of, not the first one, uh, episode four, he has already uh, evolved beyond that. And he still will retain some elements uh, of that. You know, he has to go pay off Jabba the Hutt at the beginning of Empire Strikes Back. But he, is, he starts to put his friends first. And that shows that he's evolving yeah. away from. Yeah, this he, type. yeah, he has an arc himself. Um, is there does does Chewie yeah. like is is Chewie a like like a dog? Like what like what what is the archetype for him? Is he like 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 a like a companion or or does he occupy one? Uh, I would think that Chewie would be uh, like the friendly beast archetype, okay. where he's he's a helper. Um, you know, now that I think about it, I'm not sure Chewie has his own arc because he's just always a right. badass. Yeah, I don't. Time. I don't feel like there's a lot of character development for Chewie. He's just a very likable sidekick. I mean, which I got to say, like, like yeah. within our modern mythology, the sidekick is a character, and and Chewie is the sidekick, right? Um, so, so, so we, right, we instinctively right. know what Chewie's relationship is, and Chewie has that. Like when when Han Solo dies. For some reason, Ray suddenly owns the Bloody and Falcon. <laughs> and Chewie, like, like I'm watching that, and I'm like, should right, yeah. <laughs> Chewie own the Bloody and Falcon? He's been zipping around with Han Solo for 40 years, but nope. But then again, Chewie's also not meant to be a captain. Yeah. Uh, Chewie didn't want to be a captain. Chewie wants to be the sidekick. He wants to be the lieutenant. He wants to be the first officer. He doesn't want to be in a position of command. It's right. not not his role in it. And he does he does stay with the Falcon, and he goes everywhere the Falcon goes. Throughout that trilogy, uh, yeah. Does, does, does Yoda have a different archetype than, say, like Obi-Wan Kenobi? Because Obi-Wan Kenobi, you said he's sort of the, he's got that samurai thing going. He's a warrior. There's a little bit more of a, a corporeal nature yeah. to it. He's a little, he's more physically engaged. Is, yeah. is Yoda like like a like a, a deity or like a ghost or or some other thing? Or, or it, it, he, he, may not, he may not factor That's, either. It may not be that every single one of these things maps. It's a great question. When I think of Yoda, I think of... Um, like Zen masters, yeah. Like uh, uh, Dogen, uh, primer of Zen, and uh, he speaks in koans that are meant to trick us out of our binary uh, understanding of the the illusion of separateness. He's trying to trick us into um, that awareness of holism that's always okay. already there. So that that's how I've always that makes thought sense. Of Yoda. Uh, yeah, as opposed to to Obi Wan, who's a, as you say, like a samurai character. He's a warrior. Right. Um, he's a mentor, but he's a warrior. Um, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So you you had mentioned earlier that uh, that the you know the prequels were more political. The the sequels would have been more philosophical, and perhaps were. Uh, what 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 is the nature of of? Or let me rephrase this. Mythologies can change. Do, do mythologies change interpret, interpretively on our end as well as we move forward, where we are seeing different meanings in them? Or rather, is it that just the 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 authors of creative works are are changing mythology as they move forward? What, what's what's the the nature of authorship and myth, and how organic is myth? Uh, I I think it's both, and I think we can chart the development of mythology through the different thinkers in their own times. Uh, even just the three that we've talked mostly about, the uh, Freud, Campbell, and Jung, we can see them interpreting myth uh, through different lenses. But then I also think I, there, there's a cycle going here. So as Lucas is um, adding to the mythological schema that he's gotten from Campbell, and Campbell has gotten from the past, um, it, it's growing, it's expanding. And uh, mythology is meant to be a living system. Uh, Campbell says that mythology, telling stories, 
is a biological function for humans. Um, that, that this is something that we do that is natural to us and that those stories are meant to evolve. And if you think about, um, you know, we, we attribute the Greek myths to Homer, but that's just because Homer is the one that wrote them down. Um, and so once Homer writes down the stories, uh, the, the bard stories that he would travel around and sing, uh, those stories are in a fixed form and they, they are no longer evolving. So, for, for Campbell, this uh, myth is organic, and it, it's meant to grow and change to reflect our culture, our time period, the truths that are available to us now. And, and Obi-Wan even says, uh, you will find, Luke, that many of the truths we cling to depend greatly on our own point of view. Uh, so one thing, and it, I've all, I kind of laugh at this because it, it drives Star Wars fanboys crazy. Every time Lucas goes back in and changes something, every time he's re-released a movie, he he tweaks it here and there. That the most current example is for the Disney Plus version of um, uh, Episode Four, A New Hope. You know, there's the the infamous Han shot right, first yeah. moment where Han shot first, and the and then um, when he did the special edition before the prequels came out, they shot at the same time, or I think Greedo actually shot first. And then he released another version where they shoot at the same time. Well, now Greedo says this word, which I, I'm not sure what it means. But he, he, he says McClunky right before Han shoots him, which wasn't in the last version. So there's always, he's always adding more to it. I, I can't tell you what McClunky means. Um, but you know, there, there are fans who are really up by these changes. Uh, but, to my mind, it's really interesting because we're, we're in the, the era of authorship. We're, we're in the era of uh, copyright um, and copyright infringement. And, and, you know, once we have a product that is released, that is the product that we have. And it doesn't change. But the, the mythological imperative, um, we see that alive in Star Wars in, in two different ways. One, in every new release, including new information, and two, in that galaxy being opened up to more storytellers telling stories using the same schemas, um, but really expanding on the stories we already know and creating a whole cosmology of, of Star Wars stories for us. And this, so this, this story system continues to grow after the point where Lucas has said, you know, someone else can do this now. So it's, it's going to out. Yeah. Well, that, like so that, that first makes yeah. sense with, with Lucas and um, changing the film. I'll admit that that irritated me when he, when he changed the, the Greedo moment. I, yeah. Well, it irritates I, I, me I, I think specifically in that one, it irritates me because he's, he's altering the ethical nature of Han Solo, but for a lot of the other things, right? Like if it's just a detail thing, um, I could see getting into a headspace of guys, this is not meant to be, a, a, a canonical work of details. It's not that the, de the the factoids are the important thing. They're actually incidental. They're the medium by which this deeper concept is being communicated. And, and the deeper concept is not Absolutely. being sullied by this. The de like he's he's trying to figure out how to do that. And that. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I can also see how those deeper concepts would change. Like, um, like when you talk about truth, like I was thinking about how um, most cultures have uh, particularly for men, because I, I, I should say it, coming into adulthood, for most cultures, coming into adulthood for women is a biological function. It's the first time they menstruate. That's they become a woman. And it's that's, that's just kind of built in for, for guys. It has to be a social construct because there's no clear biological moment. Um, there's just, you know, pubescence. And so right. um, there are, uh, you know, like there's various various uh, religious rites or, or rituals that we go through, but but the nature of, of adulthood has changed. Like we're we're one of the first cultures, to my knowledge, that has a concept of teenagers or tweens. Like if you were to go back a thousand years, that was not a thing. You were either a, a boy or a man, which is why like your bar mitzvah, you were a man. Like you could now you could right. carry swords on behalf of the tribe, and you would fight in the war, and you had to go get a job and you know hunt, and you could have a wife. Like there like there there was no concept of like well you're going to go in a gap year. And you know, really, really explore right, yeah. <laughs> whether you want to be an artist or a lawyer. That was not a thing, but it is a thing for us. We do have an intermediate state that we have in sure. our culture. And so we have to have ways to figure out how to express that reality of the social world that we live in and coming up with new myths for it. So right. then, then uh, 
pointing it at us, uh, I feel like myth then and Star Wars then would not merely be a fun story, but rather are meant to have some sort of personal application um, that we could have in them. Like I'll say just in, in watching Absolutely. those videos of Bill Moyers and Joseph Campbell talking, like it really made me think because Campbell, when he's describing the hero's journey, he talks about the hero that confronts the, um, he confronts the, 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 the villain, the bad guy, the conflict, he triumphs and he returns back to where he's from. And like, and I was like, well, right. like I, I'm from right. Oklahoma, where where uh, where I'm broadcasting, and you live, but I've been living in New York and L.A. for a very long time. And for a lot of people in New York and L.A., going back home is defeat. It means that you've you've given up and you couldn't mm -hmm. hack it. And I was like, well, that's not how Campbell would look at it. Campbell would look at it like you went out and you did an amazing thing, and now you've come back greater than you left, and you can now be a part of of your your home again. And I was like, that that is a very different. A mental approach. And it made me think, and I, I imagine that there's lots of just sort of practical, or I should say personal application um, to these myths that, that you can intuit. Yes. Well, and uh, I mean, to the extent that we could consider spirituality practical, which I certainly do, um, that that's a function here. So the the hero doesn't just go out to, to get some physical object and, and return with it. The hero goes out to gain this new awareness. And for Campbell, that's that apotheosis, like we talked about earlier, um, that realizing your own divinity um, is is this awareness of a holistic sense. It, it's almost a paradox. I think I uh, described it to you earlier as a mm -hmm. Mobius strip of like the spiritual dimension of life that is always already around us all the time. And the, the depths of our own psychology that are connected. Somehow the outside is connected to the inside. Um, and all of our binary um, divisions that we impose onto the world through our concepts fall away. And that is the boon that the hero gains from that apotheosis that they then bring back to their civilization. So, again, Campbell's seeing all of this as forces in our own psychology. So, so you would set out from your ordinary mindset or, you know, for me, I think like, when am I going to have a cup mm, of coffee yeah. or what time do I need to get on the road to go to school? That, those kind of things. Uh, you'd set out from that to go into this deep contemplative state um, where your uh, Buddhist meditation, uh, your, your, uh, the, the focus of your attention has shifted. Um, for me, this happens a lot when I'm reading, uh, when I watch the wind blow through the leaves in a tree or uh, the leaves of grass in my front yard while I'm reading. And there, there's this, this state of accord that we can enter into, which uh, Campbell would say that is that apotheosis, is realizing the spiritual nature of everything all the time and then bringing that back so if we were to go down into our depths, realize that accord, and then bring that back into our ordinary mindset, that is the hero's journey for him. Uh, and sometimes that, that happens externally as well. Um, but all we can really control, all we really have control over is ourselves. And so we are the ones who have to set out on that hero's journey all the time. And, and that's what I meant when I discussed the macro and microcosm. Uh, like, so your geographical relocation is a macrocosm, but in every moment we have a choice, just like Luke Skywalker has a choice. A in every moment we have a choice of what we are going to focus our attention on. Um, and if we are going down and finding that accord and then bringing it back up to our conscious mind to live in this state of harmony and holism, then that is uh, enacting the hero's journey in every, every moment of everyone's life which is a, a really cool thing to think yeah, about. Yeah, and I have to say, you've made me think of Star Wars differently, which is a, an impressive task, given how long awesome. I've had Star Wars kicking around my brain. Uh, I just really want to thank you for having me here today. It's, it, it's been wonderful to talk through all these things with you. It, it always feels good to discuss it. Thank you so much, Dr. Schlesinger. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Every week in the podcast, my comedian friend and I, Nick Sperduti, we visit some other planet, or world, or dimension, and we haven't been able to do it under lockdown until now. What? What do you mean? What are you talking about? So, Spurduti, you know you know how we've been trapped in your apartment with uh, your spouse and a Gungan and a bunch of Wookiees, and we haven't been able to leave in a really long time? And the iguana. And our and the iguana. Drink. 
You always leave people out. I've noticed that. Protocol droid. I'm sorry. We have a big retinue that lives in the apartment with us. Okay. It just feels like you I'm mention sp- everybody. Okay. You know? So AJ19, <sighs> Joe Blob, Tarful. D- okay. I'm not going to go through this. There's. <laughs> I was going to say, I, was gonna, I would have been really surprised if yeah. you nailed it. Anyway, go my ahead. point is, Nick, uh, okay, uh, we're getting away from this incredible thing. Come here. I, come with me to the kitchen. Okay. What What are you doing? Look Stop. in the fridge. Look at the back of the fridge. What do you see? Why are you taking things out of the fridge? I see food. I see leftover pasta from right. last night. That's, I That's mean, why I'm throwing stuff at but, yeah, Okay, look past the food to the back of the fridge. Wait, what is that? Why is that, that glowing? That is an interdimensional portal if I've ever seen one. It looks like a broken fridge. Uh, it looks like we should call somebody to get something fixed. That is... Okay, yes, maybe we should, because I do think that it's it's it seems that the temperature is a little bit lower, but... Okay. Oh, the no, my hot sauce! I, it fell through the portal! It is a portal! Yeah, see, see that's my point. Spurduty. That was my Cholula! Don't think about the fridge for the minute. Think about the fact that we've got an interdimensional gateway in your kitchen that we can use to get out of your apartment. But Cholula's not cheap! Okay. How, oh my God. That was on sale. What if? Okay. What if we just? Can we? If if we if we're quick, can we put everything in the freezer? Or alternately, we can put ice in the sink, and then we can go through this interdimensional gateway okay. and go yeah, exploring. Well, okay. Tarful has milk in there, and and there's there's fresh chicken. Megan just bought chicken. Okay. Yeah. All right. Hold on. I gotta wrap up this chicken then if we're gonna freeze it, because you can't just okay. put it in with the packaging. I mean, come on. What are we lunatics? Right. Okay. I just. Oh my god, I'm... Wafaro! <laughs> Come here. Okay, Heaton and I are gonna run through this portal real quick. Can you put everything in the fridge, back in, and then shut the door when we get through the portal? Thanks, Wafaro. You're the champ, man. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, buddy. Love that guy. Okay, all right. Uh, you wanna go first, buddy? I probably should. Yeah. And uh, here I go. Holy moly. Whoa! Oh, it's freezing. It- it's free. It, what a relief! It's it's summer back in New York Ugh, and so hot and sweltering. This is a for just a, a crisp, cold, pristine place. And look at this beautiful land here. It's snowy. There's pine trees. Oh, this really is a dimensional portal. I was expecting yeah. to like go into the other apartment. You know what I was afraid of, Nick? I was afraid we were going to go into John Malkovich's brain. Like, that was my fear, but not that at all. That is one we, of my we, worst nightmares. We appear honestly. to be in, like, maybe New Hampshire or Maine. Hey, don't you guys have coats? Jesus oh! Christ! It is, okay, that is... What the... Uh, very much a talking beaver. That is a talking, walking beaver. Hi, um... I'm Nick. I'm, I'm Heaton, hello. Nick and Heaton, hello. You're going to catch a chill out here without that's coats. That's true. I'm going to catch my oh, desert he's a cold. Nice, he's a nice talking beaver. Well, that's good. I'm glad the first beaver I met was pretty nice. Or Anyway, what's your name? I'm Mr. Beaver. Oh, Okay, well, it's a little little reductive, but that's fine. Easy. Nice yeah. to meet you. Yeah, nice Mr. to meet you. It's spelled out. It's a family name. Mr. Beaver, it's nice to meet you. So are we... Where are we exactly? Are we on another planet? Like, 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 what? What is the name of this glorious, pristine, cold world that we're on with the talking beaver? Narnia. Oh, Narnia. Narnia. Nick, is that I, what he's I, saying? I've, I'm sorry, I've never said it like that. Say that again. Narnia. Narnia. Is there a name? Nick, he's clearly saying Narnia. All right. Hey, you know what? Fine. Well, good. I, I'm glad we've established that. So, uh, Mr. Beaver, I imagine that you are uh, blown away. By seeing, you know, these yeah. two. Have you ever seen this kind of a shirt? Clearly, you guys are from Earth. We get a lot of you guys. Wait, how did you know we're from Earth? This is just where interdimensional portals open up to. Sometimes people come through furniture. Sometimes people come from spaceships. Uh, but I feel like once a year, we've got somebody coming through here. Cool. If you guys stay out here in these rags, you're gonna you're gonna freeze to death. That's true. Problem. Let's get yeah. inside. I hadn't I hadn't anticipated winter yet. Uh, so. Can you take us to, you know, a motel? I got a dam. That'd be great. Thank you. I was just fishing for that. I didn't want to, like, ask you, but I would love to come to your dam. This is this is my dam. Do you guys do you guys party? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, uh, never mind. Well, well, we'll we'll talk about that later. All right. Uh, let's just get some coats on you guys. Nice. We actually had a large batch of family pass away recently. Very sorry to hear that. I'm so well, sorry Well, thank for your you losses. for that, but honestly, it's fine. I just want you to know we got a lot of pelts here. 
And, oh. uh, you know, we just be selling them to townspeople anyway, so we may as well put them in through a test run. Can, can I wear this one? Sure. And was this someone you were related to? Yes. Who was it? That one was my son, Tyler. So I'm wearing your son, Tyler, to avoid the cold? No, my son, Tyler, is protecting you from the cold. Okay, yes, thank you. I'm, I'm very grateful. This one has a lovely scent on it. Is this Would this be your mother by any chance? That's uh, that's just our general aroma, but let me check. Oh, no, that is that that was that was my mother. Yeah. Okay, wow. I could kind of I had that feeling, you know, it just kind you kind of feel like a mother. You had no idea. You had no idea. It was coincidence. It's written mother on the inside. And let let me let me just say that this is this is a level of 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 hosting that I have never encountered before. We really appreciate you letting us wear your deceased family as pelts. Uh, that's how we do in Narnia. Yeah, you. That's that's great. Um, so like, you know, I assume we can stay here tonight. Uh, tomorrow, is there like, you know, sightseeing? I'm guessing there's a ski lift somewhere. Like what Like what would you want to get up to, Mr. Beaver? We can't do anything under the witch's watch. Oh. oh. Okay, so oh, that's wait, real. Oh, wait, she's real? Yeah, that's a thing. Okay, I just kind of figured that was a character, but that's like you're terrorized by a witch? Oh, man. Character? No, there's a very real problem here. We're all being watched by the overlord, the witch, up in the tower. Oh, holy Moses. Okay. That's that's crazy. OK, so if I remember correctly, there's some kind of a lion that can help. Lion's dead. Yeah, I remember that part, too. Lion died pretty early. Died, came back, died again, died oh. again. Oh, oh, I see the lion pelt. I should have grabbed that one. Oh, man, we could have got. I mean, the Tyler pelt's great. The Tyler pelt's really great. Uh I, I am, you, you guys have picked up on it. I am sadly a, a pelter. I am the, the town pelter. Oh, well, that we lucky we found you since we're so cold. That was, that was lucky. We could have ran into some other beaver who didn't, who didn't even know how to pelt. Excuse me while I just take this needle out for a moment. I, I have to do something while I explain what's going on here to you. Are you diabetic? No, I have to ex- extract castorium from my anus to to sell the goo to the witch so that they can flavor f- food what what in, like, what is, what is like, castorium is that like heroin it's a goo like substance with that i i develop in a sack inside of my anus i have to extract it to, to make ends meet because the pelts aren't enough okay this, this is so hyper specific so is castorium a real thing produced by beavers Yes, we produce them in sacks. Even you humans, this is where we learned to do this. We never used to sweeten our food with, with anus juice before you humans came around and told oh. us that's that can be done. And now I have to pull this out of my anus and sell it. Castorium. You're telling me that we eat food that flavor that's flavored like an anus? Yeah, if something says natural flavors, it could be made with castorium. Jesus, and that's that's like a biochemical that beavers make? Legit. That wow. is incredibly disturbing. <laughs> oh, you're crying. Oh, I'm saying, is it because oh, is it because of your dead beaver family, or because you the have needle to? Needle hurts so badly in my anus. Oh, I'm really I, sorry I, about that. That uh, feels like maybe we could come back. Maybe we can yeah, go back through the fridge. There's there's a greater problem, and I you can stay here, but I need your help. You must help us defeat the witch in the Great Ring. Okay. Oh. Um. Oh, it's one of those kind of mission things all right so listen mr beaver we really appreciate you taking us into your dam and uh letting us wear your your family as pelts to stave off the cold that's very kind very neighborly of you but i think you need to understand that that spurduti and i regularly uh visit worlds of star trek and and we we've deep within us imbibed the concept of the, uh, the the prime directive, and we don't know enough about your planet to to really deal with the the ramifications of taking out leadership positions. Like I I don't know uh, if if you, know, you say she's a witch. What if she's just a very empowered woman, and and, and your society takes a dim view of that? What if uh, what what if what if there's a power vacuum that opens up and some sort of uh, ISIS situation comes in? I I, really I killed don't... her. All good, buddy. Uh, you killed the witch? Yeah, I shot her right in the head. 
Gee, <laughs> uh, I got her. Okay. That she didn't try and st- she didn't try and stop you with magic or anything. She didn't seem to be very magical. She like had a sword and she was like coming at me and I just shot her right, right, right in the face. I don't. She's she's dead. She's she's totally dead. Uh yeah, dead deadest I've ever seen someone. So the ring has been defeated. Yeah, there were a couple of guards, if that's what that means, on the way up that I also had to pop. So the but, evil, you know, magical casualty. witch has been defeated, Mr. Beaver. <laughs> oh, look, look how, how happy look he how is. Happy. He's so excited. Oh, we, we, helped a, we helped a townsperson and his, his, his village of people rally against this, this evil witch, I guess. Well, now that she's dead, okay, so if you think of it this way, like, I killed she's the dead. evil witch... Uh-huh. And you get to now be free. And now the whole kingdom is probably going to be free from this tyrannical rule. Like, this is amazing. Mr. Beaver, what what are you going to do now? What are your plans? It turns out we're heroes, Nick. Yeah, good. We did a good thing. Oh, you've you've liberated me. That's for sure. <laughs> Great. Good. 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 Oh, he's so because, happy. Giddy. Oh, what what to do first? I mean, there's so many things I've dreamt about this moment for for uh, months. Yeah, like like go canoeing with your family, travel more. Yeah. Oh, I think the first thing is I have to move up into the tower because and, no. and take what is mine as as well, as the the heroine king of Narnia. What? Wait, I'm sorry. What? Yeah. What? Oh yeah, the ring. The ring is it, it's it's a big drug ring. Wait. So when you when you're saying the witch, do you did you mean a literal witch? Oh no 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 no. She was. That's just what we call her. She's the witch. Everybody has street nicknames. You think they call me Mister Beaver on the streets? That makes sense. Why she didn't fight me with magic? She just like turned with a sword and I shot her in the face. No, that was just basic self defense, defending her drug ring. So the Ooh. okay. So the witch was just a heroin dealer that dominated the Narnia drug trade. Oh, but the worst kind, the dirtiest, most disgusting, lowest quality stuff. I only I only make the good stuff. You know, I I th- I think we're just going to go back to the refrigerator. Mr. Beaver, thank you so much for your hospitality and letting me Are wear you your... leaving? Yeah, I think things we're... are just about to get real exciting and good and rich. I bet real rich. so, but but I all the same, I think this isn't really our scene. We're just going to take off. I think we've done too okay, much. Okay, well, don't don't leave without taking a token of my gratitude. Oh, uh, neither of us do drugs. I don't need anything, thanks. Uh, That's oh, no, right. not drugs. It, it won't. It won't take long. I'll just. I'll just, you know, skin the witch a little, uh, real quick, and uh, I could make you a pair of gloves or something. No, no. I, I felt fairly the- uncomfortable wearing your son as a pelt. I feel very uncomfortable wearing a dead woman as a pelt. This is just, even in even in the winter, I just. I. I, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. No, okay, not your thing. That's cool. That's cool. I'm cool. Uh, I've got it. Take this bottle of castorium see that i was actually kind of fishing for i will take okay that. you know what i i gotta say i was against that now compared to the the dead witch pelt and the the heroin the castorium seems downright harmless amazing thanks so much man hey nick let's get the fuck out of here real quick and just never come back does that sound good great uh i i would like to ask for a favor since i did kind of the heavy lifting here mm-hmm. uh can i keep your mom because honestly, very comfy, and I'm gonna be cold on the way back through. Up to you. This is it's your mom. Whatever you decide. Promise me this this one thing. Yo, go ahead. You will always refer to it as being protected by Mother Beaver. One does not wear Mother Beaver. One is protected by Mother <laughs> Beaver. I promise. Mother Beaver will protect me for all my days. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put this Tyler pelt here on the chair. Uh, well, gosh, what a what a fine, fine, handsome garment this son of yours must have been. And uh, I I think I could probably hoof it back to the interdimensional portal. Uh, I really I I like cold weather. It's fine. It makes me frisky. I'm, I'm just I'm gonna head out. Nick, let's go. Goodbye. I'll see you later. So I'm gonna say this right now. I think like we did a good thing. I okay. to be fair, you keep trying to take credit, but I feel I did all of this. You just kind of stood here. I'll, I'm going to give you this one. No, I'm happy to give you this one, Nick. You're the one who shot the drug dealer in the face while I was monologuing. This is on you. Shot three to six guards, and we learned some stuff about Castorium. So it was an educational thing either way. Now what a nice fella. Can I say that? What a sweetheart. Oh my God! I mean, let's just let's just go home. <laughs> do you want to huddle under under Mother Beaver? Yeah, a little bit. 
Uh, All right, get in here, buddy. Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and close the podcast now about 18 minutes later than I should have. Uh, Nick, it was nice to see. Uh, it was nice to go on an adventure with you again. No problem, buddy. I love being warm with you every day, especially under Mother Beaver. That's the show. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Dr. Ryan Schlesinger, for coming on to discuss the hero's journey. If you want to keep up with Dr. Schlesinger, you can visit his website, ryanschlesinger.com. That's R-Y-A-N-S-L-E-S-I-N-G-E-R.com. Thanks, Nick Paloey, for voicing Mr. Beaver. And thanks, Nick Spurduti, for killing that lady who might not even have been a drug dealer at all. We literally killed somebody because a talking beaver we just met accused somebody else we never met of being a heroin-dealing witch. That was enough to kill a person, and that would not at all hold up in a court of law. Good job, 